My father taught me that angels and demons walk among us, clothed in human flesh. The trick is to tell which switch. That was Agnes O'Casey, star of the brilliant new film, Lies We Tell, which opens the Washington, D.C. Solus Nua Capital Irish Film Festival on February 29th. And I'm John Lee. And I'm Martin Nutty. This episode of Irish Stew is woman strong and a little different from what we normally do. Think of it as a prelude and two acts. We'll start with Solus Nua director Maeve McCullough, who'll tell us about the film festival. And then we're joined by director Lisa Mulcahy and writer Elizabeth Gooch. Finally, we'll conclude with Agnes O'Casey for our latest global Irish nation conversation here on Irish Stew. This episode is sponsored by Chantella your all-in-one business launchpad in the United States. Committed to excellence and execution, Chantella helps enterprises enter or expand in the U.S. market through bespoke project management and strategic planning solutions. Create and realize your vision with Chantella, where they invest their passion in your future success. To learn more, go to Chantella.space. Yes, dot .space. It's a thing. Well, welcome back to another episode of Irish Stew. And today we're going to do something a little bit different. We have three guests we're going to talk to. And uh, Martin, why don't you set it up for us? What's in store? Well, John, great to be back on Irish Stew, which is the beginning of season six, which just happens to coincide with the Capital Irish Film Festival, which is being held in Washington, D.C. over four nights beginning on February 29th and running through March 3rd. We're delighted to have three of the principals from the opening night film, Lies We Tell. First, we'll be joined by director Lisa Mulcahy and screenwriter Elizabeth Gooch, and later we'll be talking with lead actor Agnes O'Casey, who not only shares the name of a certain famous Irish playwright, but also happens to be his great-granddaughter. Lisa Mulcahy is an IFTA award-winning director and has multiple credits with Irish, British, and American television. This is her fourth feature film, and her recent TV work includes the excellent Ridley Road, which is played on both sides of the Atlantic and coincidentally features Agnes O'Casey. Elizabeth Gooch is a screenwriter with an interest in subversive adaptations of neglected classics, featuring Irish writers such as Maria Edgeworth, and now, with lies we tell, Sheridan Le Fanu. Before we start, we're going to hear from Maeve McCullough of the DC-based Irish arts organization, Solus Nua. Maeve is the director of the Capital Irish Film Festival, and here she tells us what we can expect down in the nation's capital. The 18th annual Sullis Nua Capital Irish Film Festival is our largest programme to date. We have 17 features and 20 shorts in three shorts programmes. We are featuring thrillers, gritty feminism, literature, themes of containment. The lineup includes 17 feature films, four North American and nine regional premieres. And we have 20 shorts films this year in three shorts programs. And our third additional shorts program this year is dedicated to Screen Ireland funded shorts. We have our Norman Houston, a short film award winner. We've Q&As with filmmakers and special events with dignitaries. And we have many visiting artists from Ireland, thanks to our support from Culture Ireland. This year's programme, we are really trying to focus on the work of Irish women in film and 10 of the 17 features have either been written or directed by women. We have six Irish directors making their feature film debuts. We have films from Northern Ireland and we have partnered with the Irish Film Institute's international film programme, Culture Ireland, Screen Ireland and Northern Ireland Screen. And all of the films this year have either been seeded or funded, developed and crafted in Ireland. The majority are Irish set and relate to Irish themes of identity and place, but many have nothing to do with Ireland at all and are stories that will resonate with our DC audiences here as much as Irish audiences. 
They present complex and universal narratives and they speak to the experience of compassion, love, resilience and the humanity in all of us. Our lineup explores power, displacement, survival, belonging and heroism. And many of the films will shock and they'll thrill and inspire. And we really hope that they'll provoke some thoughtful reflection and discussion. There's a story for everyone and you definitely do not need to be Irish to experience and enjoy these films. They are very local and rooted in many ways in Ireland, but they are definitely global in reach. I'm so thrilled to open the festival with director Lisa Mulcahy's Lies We Tell. This is a phenomenal film and features an all-female creative team with writer Elizabeth Gooch, producer Ruth Carter, and it stars Agnes O'Casey, great-granddaughter of the Irish playwright Sean O'Casey. What's really important about this film is that it was created through Screen Ireland's POV scheme, which supports women filmmakers. And it came out of this need to address gender parity within Irish screen industries. So we're thrilled that this film is opening the festival. And now to our conversation with Lisa Mulcahy and Elizabeth Gooch. Let's start off with Lisa here. Uh, this is a, we're actually recording this on Valentine's Day, and uh, Valentine's Day brings to mind romantic candlelit dinners. But I'm I'm looking at a, a review from the Irish Independent, which refers to how you, as the director, sustained the gothic tension nicely, particularly during an excruciatingly awkward series of mournful candlelight dinners. You you really set a mood in that. Uh, in your film that carried all the way through. And I'm meeting you now. I expected to meet someone dour and serious, and I'm, I'm feeling your personality. So how do you shuttle back from Lisa, the person, to Lisa, the director, who's bringing out these strange, dark emotions? Um, well, you know, there, there are, as you saw, there are a lot of, uh, quite a lot of uh, nighttime dinner scenes. And um, we were always going to have a challenge with our level of budget about um, the lighting. And it was a perfect opportunity for me to do something which I have never been able to do, which is not use lights. <laughs> um, now we did do a little bit, but uh, all the night scenes are shot with candles. So whereas we might have used, say, a bit of uh, reflection from the ground, you know, some white sheets or whatever on the ground, but they're all lit with candles. And that was something I just always wanted to do. And funny enough, I say that if I was working on something that had a much bigger budget, I'd have a much bigger and more difficult challenge persuading people that shooting scenes in candlelight is the way to go. And in this instance, I didn't have to persuade anybody. And, you know, you see how beautiful it looks. And, um, yeah, we just had really, really fun time. And it was just Eleanor, who's the, Eleanor Bowman, who's the DOP. We just talk, talk, spoke from the start about that's how we were going to shoot all our night scenes. And, and, that, we were going to, and that we were going to use as little... Um, as little electrical light in the film as possible across the board. Uh, I'm so interested you said that because the, the candlelit aspect really uh, showed up to me. And as I've mentioned to our, our uh, listeners who are bored with hearing it, I was an art history major in college. So I was seeing, I was seeing uh, Georges de la Tour uh, illumination and I was seeing Vermeer uh, beautiful, beautiful all throughout. Yeah, yeah, it really is. The, the quality of light and the mood that these candles give is just, just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, talk to us a little bit, uh, if you will, Elizabeth, about sense and time of place in this film. I, I, I have the benefit of actually recognising exactly where it was filmed, having come from North County Dublin. Um, it's filmed in, I believe, Ardgill and Castle. But... The lighting is an aspect of this that kind of sets the time and place for me. Plus the sounds, I felt very immersed in a different time. Obviously, I can't say, you know, is this legitimate 1860s or not? I might be old, but I'm not that old. Um, but uh, how do you go about imagining something like that? Well, the book was written in 1864. And... Mm -hmm. The real appeal of the book was that it had a fantastic premise, 
that the person who's supposed to protect you is actually out to get you. But the problem <laughs> with the book for a modern audience is that the heroine is a complete Gothic Victorian drip who spends 400 pages running around confused and wondering why everyone's so mean to her and begging them to be nicer. So the, the real spark for the adaptation was my incredible frustration with her and writing profane things in the margin every time, like here she goes again, until one time, and I think it was probably my fifth reread, I went, I just don't buy this. She's faking the stupid victim act. It's her cover story. And that was the huge spark of electricity that unlocked the whole story. The motivation to set her free of Le Fanu, who loved to invent these smart, sensitive heroines and then dismantle them. But once you have the idea that actually she has agency and fierceness and knows exactly what's going on, so Innocent Victim is just her cover story that allows her to do what she needs to do, then you could use all the lovely historical problems that women faced at that time, whether it was corsets or guardians or doctors, or that under the law, you have no power. <laughs> All of those things could be assets in helping us tell this modern story about how difficult it is to fight for your power when no one will help you. Yeah. And um, I, just to kind of uh, jump in and explain the name of the original author in the book of course is uncle silas and the author is sheridan le fanu who, who sounds deeply un-irish but apparently is of french huguenot extraction um but as i understand that the original book uh uncle silas um and i'm not sure whether i should ask elizabeth this or lisa this was um uh, set in britain um, and the, now it's returns read, to Ireland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Sorry. He he wrote this story for almost forty years. He the first time he wrote it was a short story when he was a young man, um, and then he reissued it again as a short story. And both of those were set in Ireland, but the financial reality for authors at the time was you couldn't actually make a living writing books either for the Irish public or set in Ireland. So when it came to novelizing it, he said it in England, but it was important to us to bring it back to Ireland. So that was just one of the, the key changes from novel to screen. Yeah, I, I had uh, I noticed that, uh, you know, I, I, I read a little bit and I saw that you did make you know, some dramatic changes in, in the book. But I read something about the author. Uh, I'll, I'll note to you and see your reaction, both of you, really, the, saying that he specialized in tone and effect rather than shock and shock horror. And he liked to leave important details unexplained and mysterious. I felt that the both the writing and the visual uh, realization of the film did match up with that evaluation of the author. Uh, um, well, just in relation to tone, I, I I did of course read the book. The film is really quite different. I mean, it has lots of similarities, but as uh, you know, as Elizabeth says. The character of Maud in the book is really infuriating uh, from the start, absolutely infuriating. And But it was really important to read the book because purely because it was written in 1864, five, um, four, four, four. <laughs> in 1864. And so, and it is very descriptive and you really, from, from the absolute outset, you feel you're there. You feel you're in those dark rooms that uh, Le Fanu describes. So, so even though it's it's quite a troll to get through the book, it was hugely important from my point of view that uh, I, I could just uh, absorb all of that tone that he really is um, quite quite detailed about. But um, just your take, Lisa, on the Irishness of this. So Le Fanu is obviously an Irish guy, right? But the book originally was in, was in Britain. Um, talk about 
bringing it back, you know, setting it in an Irish uh, scene, like John and me, when we were discussing the film afterwards, kind of said, you know, at least from John's perspective, uh, that he saw it, and I'm putting words in his mouth, he said it could be set in England as far as, as, far as I was concerned in terms of the look and feel. And I said, to me, that's a, that rings up absolutely accurate because there's, I know or I encountered Anglo-Irish people growing up in Ireland, and that rings very true to me. But I'm kind of wondering, you know, how you kind of attack that and the people say, well, it should really be set in England. Well, I mean, we wanted it, it to be set in Ireland, as and as Elizabeth said, you know, the, uh, the stories at, in, at some stage was in Ireland. I mean, at that time, we are still dealing with, for the want of other words, upper class Irish people. So who are, you know, who are educated, who would have been educated in England. Their influence is um, hugely British. But for example, when it came to uh, Aggie's accent, um, I really wanted a sense of Irishness in her accent. I mean, her cousins have a much more of an RP accent as though they they would have been um, educated by governesses and who all spoke and did, you know, said the right thing. But we really wanted Aggie, Aggie to have a sense of Irishness in her accent, which she she does. And we got um, the voice coach who who works normally at the Abbey Theatre, and she coached Aggie um, in, in her accent, so that these that the Irishness and some of the teas and stuff and the way she speaks do, they do come could tr- come through. And obviously, the staff their accents are, are Irish in relation to the house. Of course, Ireland was littered with houses, um, big houses and big estate houses because all these, you know, and they they were British really because they were all owned by British people um, who owned all of these estates. We could be getting into dangerous historical territory. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so in relation to the Irishness, yes, the accents and her accent and... The landscape could be Irish, but it also could be British as well, because we're in a con- it's so confined, our story, really. And the, of course, the legal system, the dominant legal system in Ireland was so influenced and controlled by the British system. So the Married Woman Property Act hasn't come in force yet, <laughs> for example. And that's true, true in both countries. But the 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 thing that was very interesting about our premiere in Galway, which was probably the only audience that didn't say afterwards, oh, this could be set in England. It was really very, very moving. Of course, we had people take the mic and ask us questions in the Q&A. But for me, the most incredibly moving moments happened afterwards when some older Irish women came up to me and apologized for taking time because they thought I had somewhere more, you know, important or swish to be. And there was no more (laughs) important place than to listen to them. And they said how meaningful the story was to them, that they didn't expect what they were going to see and that it felt real and true for them. And what felt real and true was the family dynamic that the dining room table is an arena and you are fighting for your life while you're sitting there and having to defer to the person in power. So there are things that maybe only if you're Irish, you might perceive as Irish, but the intent was that there were universal dynamics that anyone anywhere could feel are true. You you had mentioned uh, the legal system there, and it it was over one of these dinners. And and you might notice that Martin and I, we're not trying to walk through the script. We like to talk about films from a little bit different perspective and not give away the ending or give away any of the surprises that people find when they see this film and have, have it unfold for them as a kind of constant series of surprises. But it was over one of those uh, dinners that I've, the law comes up and I thought was the turning point for the film where Maud said the law, the law being made and enforced <laughs> by men. And I thought everything shifted at that point. And, 
we move we move boldly in a new direction. Yes, yeah, I think we always refer to that scene as the jewel, didn't we, Elizabeth? We did, we did, <laughs> we did. Well, that's what and it is. It, yeah, yeah, it is. And and Aggie and David, just their their chemistry and the rapport between them was so electrifying to to watch they were just so wonderful together and and the way you could see their relationship turning and them both realizing things about each other at different points you know their faces are just are just so legible i think we were so so lucky that such sensitive talented brave actors wanted to take these parts in a very very small independent film yeah, David Wilmot, who you're referring to, obviously was extraordinary, and his ability to communicate menace. Uh, yeah, you know, like yeah. really, it went up on the back of the hairs were going up in the back of my neck as I kind of watched it play out. And of course, he's telegraphing it earlier, right? But you know, it's coming, and you can mm-hmm. feel it. it yeah. Was it Hitchcock said? You know something <laughs> about there is no menace except you know, the anticipation of it. I was anticipating it. <laughs> yeah, he's wonderful, really. I mean, it was really important um, to to cast an actor who who could come across as charming and warm and, uh, you know, loving, um, potentially, as well as... Because Menace, in my mind, it's not the most difficult thing to play for an actor. But um, it was just really important that it's that it, we got a really layered um, actor to play this part, you know, and that that at some stage that we might actually feel for him because otherwise, you know, a character, if, it is, if a character is one note and just menace, it, it, it's quite boring. There's And it, it, it was so much about a battle about these two people that that would have got boring very quickly, you know. So I'd worked with David before on a series that I'd done some years ago, and I've seen him in lots of things. And um, and he brings a, you know, he brings a huge amount of his personality, his heart and his soul into a performance um, and, uh, yeah, we were just, you know, we just were delighted when he accepted. I think one of the other things that struck me about the story was there are a number of different factors at play, but there's economics seems to be on a level to underline this, this whole story. It is a struggle over the inheritance of an estate. And sadly, a young woman is in the way of a lot of greed um, but there is the other, uh, co-opting, if you will, of the, uh, servants in the house, the staff of the house who are co-opted by, let's say, um, this rather sinister takeover, um, just kind of really resonated with me as well. You know, you always hope that people will do the right thing when they see a, you know, a bad thing being done, but then there was this reality, uh, of, uh, economics in my way of looking at things. So I, d- I don't know if, 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 if that was part of your read, but it's certainly something that I sensed. Mm, I mean, they're, par- they're powerless uh, and, uh, you know, very quickly, even though, um, you know, Maud's uh, maidservants, uh, maidservant is, uh, you know, Mary Quince is completely, completely devoted to her. I mean, utterly in every possible way devoted to her. Uh, to her. Uh, she is very quickly powerless and very quickly has to just chuck all of that aside, because if she loses her position, she has nothing to fall back on. Maybe she'll get another job, but maybe she won't. And that was part of of the concept of the adaptation that we would explore that dynamic of abuse of power and the way all the characters, like every one of us today, has a choice in the face of abuse of power. You can comply or collaborate or withdraw and try and pretend it's not happening, or resist. So all 10 of the characters in this house have moments where they're forced to make that choice. 
One other aspect of the story that kept coming up, and as you know, as I looked up and tried to educate myself a little bit, I saw that the book, the original book, was referred to as a part of the you know, like in the genre of locked room mysteries, and uh, specifically uh, the room locked from the inside. And throughout throughout the book, Maud throughout the film, Maud becomes more locked, locked in and locked from the inside. And I just kind of wondered is is she was she a room herself locked from the inside? Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole idea of the feminine gothic, right? Because the whole girl meets house is a great trope, you know, from Dragonwick or Rebecca or any number of other books, Jane Eyre. Um, but the the idea of kind of feminizing the gothic is that the the woman reclaims the house. And one of the key changes from um, novel to screen was that now Silas comes to her house. So it's a home invasion by her own family, whereas in the book she goes to his house. So absolutely. And, and Maud's character arc at the beginning of the film, she thinks her power comes from outside herself, that it's given to her by her inheritance. So the arc of the story is her discovering where her power has to lie. Because sometimes you have to go to the dark side if that's where your predator is. Did that kind of theme play out with you at, at all, uh, at least? Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I think um, when we talk about Maud and, and and Elizabeth referring to her there you know, at the start, where she believes that her power is coming from the outside, Um what we love about this character, and and unless you know, this is all really in the backstory, but she had had a very um, cosseted life, and she, and and one of what you would regard as perhaps her drawbacks is actually becomes her power. You know, when she hasn't experienced society, she hasn't, she doesn't know the right way to behave, and because she doesn't know the right way to behave, she doesn't do that and so when Ilbury says you know you 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 have no experience of society and she says I should hope not and that actually her lack of experience of people her telling her what to do and you should do this and you should do that actually just allows her own strength of personality to get through this um you know and it is very it is very different from the book but but she is you know she is abandoned as the film, without telling too much away, but she's abandoned by quite a few people. <laughs> and um, and I think the fact that she has grown up in such a cluded setting with just uh, uh, with with just her father and and herself and her literature or whatever, it turns out to be a huge strength to her. So I've read, I, I think, on the uh, um, the Irish Screen Director site. Um, that this is a subversive take on the original novel. Um, do you would you agree with that? I do because I I think I wrote that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> because it, you know this this project started um, because Screen Ireland announced a competition for full funding to redress the the imbalance in taxpayer funding basically and one of the the things that we had to do we had a really short time to form a team I think they announced this scheme and you had to have a team assembled and your application and script sample ready in two weeks so it it happened that I had already started this project and Lisa and I had met on a screen training course and gotten to know each other and liked each other. And then I had met producer Ruth on at a Screen Ireland party. But at that time, I think Lisa and Ruth hadn't, hadn't met. So we, we formed a team and part of what we had to do was compete. There were, I think, 60 teams in the first application. And then we went down to 12 and then we went down to six and then we went down to four. So part of what we had to do all the way through was justify everything we were doing in as, I don't know, precede or 
exciting or surprising manner that we could possibly muster. And, and one of the surprising things that we were able to do was walk in there and say, we're going to take this really fancy pants, famous Irish novel and turn it on its, he- on its head and set its heroine free of its creator. So I think that's what we've always meant by subversive because we're subverting what Le Fanu set out to do. You know, we're, we're getting close to ha- having to wrap up here, but we'd like to, and, and we're going to be uh, speaking with uh, Agnes, your, your lead uh, actor, uh, s- shortly. Tell us a little bit about uh, working with her. I know there's some history of working with her in the past and uh, how she realized this role. <laughs> what, was, what was some of the steps along the way before this this part came out so beautifully realized. I was working on a series called Ridley Road that you mentioned, Martin, in uh, the UK when COVID happened. And so we were two weeks away from shooting. And uh, so we had to step away from that. So I came back home to Ireland and we knew, always knew that we were going to shoot this film after I had finished that series. And so we decided that we would use COVID as an opportunity to cast the lead role of Maud. Um, I always wanted and we always discussed that we would have a newcomer play the part. And we specifically wanted to, you know, we weren't, we weren't specifically didn't want to run after some famous, you know, 24 year old to play this part. We wanted a newcomer. So, um, Amy Rowan, who was our casting director, we 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 set off doing that, and we saw uh, a huge amount of self tapes of uh, actresses who had uh, who were still in drama school, who'd left drama school, had never been to drama school, and Aggie was one of them, and she just possesses um, so many qualities. You know, she 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 sits in a, the world of eighteen sixty four very well. She just has that aura about her and she has a kind of a steely determination and a bright intelligence, but also a vulnerability about her. She, she possessed all these qualities that we wanted Maud to possess. And so we very quickly knew that we wanted her to be Maud. And so we cast her. And then when I went back to England and we took up, we, we lost our lead actress for Ridley Road. Uh, so I mentioned to the casting director on Ridley Road, I said, you should see Agnes O'Casey, which we did. And so we cast her as the lead in Ridley Road. So myself and Aggie did that show together first. And it was, she, she hadn't even finished drama school. She was in her final year. So this was a big budget BBC, uh, uh, drama, period drama, 1960s drama. And it was, you know, she was working with some amazing actors, British actors, Rory Kinnear, like incredible actors. And she just completely stepped up to the challenge. She's just a wonderful girl, really. And we just chatted for a week together before, you know, about everything to do with the film and this film and the tangents we went off on and, and everything. So by the time we came to shoot it, we really knew each other's uh, methods of working quite well. It uh, certainly comes across in the film, uh, and you're both to be congratulated. <laughs> She's wonderful. I take mm. no credit. She's fabulous. Mm. <laughs> but, um, yeah, and obviously it's a great uh, adaptation. Uh, well, I'll back off that. I'll say uh, I found the script to be totally engaging and uh, uh, as were obviously the moving images it, it works and so you know it's clearly a great collective effort it's great to see uh, a film represented in a way uh, that is let's say f- woman strong for a change <laughs> and uh, it's 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 just a really fresh perspective so With that, we're going to uh, move over to Agnes now, and we would like to thank uh, you, Lisa Mulcahy, and, of course, Elizabeth Gooch for giving us some insight from a director and screenwriting point of view. And now we're going to talk to the star. (laughs) Great. Thank you so much. I'm delighted that we're now joined by Agnes O'Casey, whose career is in its first inning, but she's already compiled an impressive list of credits on stage, TV, and film, working with luminaries such as Maggie Smith, Laura Linney, Rory Kinnear, and Eddie Marsan. 
to name just a few. We're delighted that she's joining us to talk about her leading and compelling performance as Maud Ruthen in the 19th century Gothic period drama, Lies We Tell. So welcome, Agnes. Thank you for having me. Well, much appreciate having you aboard. Let me, you know, as we looked in, we we realized that perhaps your parents weren't completely in line with your uh, departure into show business, into acting. And um, we saw uh, in an article, your father joked that uh, your first job uh, in show business might be in the UK hospital drama show Casualty as body number three. It sounds like, uh, from what Martin just said, you, you've you exceeded expectations. Well, thank goodness. I think as soon as I got my first job, which was with the same director as Lies We Tell, it was Ridley Road, it was the lead in a BBC show, which wasn't how any of us thought it would go. That was very surreal. I could feel my dad sort of exhaling a bit. He was like, <laughs> okay, finally. After years of being like, when I got into drama school, he was like, oh God, I really hope to live <laughs> You know, it was. All, <laughs> it's okay now. And what's funny is my little sister's going to be an actor as well. Uh-huh. So. I think Co- Kevin Costner started out as a body, uh, as far as I remember, in The Big Chill, and his body piece got cut. So <laughs> you know, you're, you're in good company, let's mm-hmm. say, in terms yeah. of having a you know impact. You know, well, that's brutal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it was all. It, it is funny to think back now, and thank God it worked out because otherwise I would have been so annoyed having to say to my dad, "Okay, fair, you were right." <laughs> and there was, there was show business in the family, right? There was acting and the creative work in the family. So often you don't want your kids to take up your line of work, I find. Well, that's exactly it. I, I think because I came from a creative family, they were like, well, could you not do something else? And my dad kind of thought I could be academic, even though I definitely couldn't have been. He was like, you might have a chance here to do something normal. And we've all made these mistakes. Like, uh-huh. But they raised me. I was thinking about this recently. Yeah. Like, they probably didn't realize, but they were raising me to be an artist of some kind. You know, right. it was always like music and always being taken to galleries and films. Like, it's funny that they'd turn around and be like, what? You want to... <laughs> <laughs> have, you, have you considered law? Yeah, exactly. well, that's literally, he was like, please be a lawyer. <laughs> well, we're thankful that that didn't happen. Uh, and um, But of course, uh, you chose O'Casey as your stage name uh, or actor name. Or, um, and that's in honor of your great grandfather, who, of course, is extremely well known. In Irish circles, Sean O'Casey, a playwright, probably the preeminent playwright of the early 20th century in Ireland. Um, <clears throat> so I'm just wondering, everybody in Ireland knows that name, but in England and America, probably less well known. So talk to me about the burden and the benefit of choosing the name. I think for me, it was sort of sentimental reasons. I wanted to feel more connected to the name. I always wanted to have the name, but because it was sort of like a patri, you know, I, I lost it because it was my, through my grandma and there aren't many O'Casey's left. And seeing his plays is the reason I wanted to be an actor. You know, I, I, I was taken from a very young age from like, sky, I think I was five. My grandma says she, I was eight. I was like, because uh, for those who know his plays, they're quite um, taxing and upsetting at times for children. But that's where, you know, it was, it was in those theatres that made me discover what I wanted to do. And so it, it made sense and it felt right to sort of like claim that as my sort of acting name. I, I wanted to, to do it in that regard. So, yeah, I guess in terms of the burden, I, I have found I was going to be in one of his plays one of my first jobs was going to be Shadow of a Gunman but it got closed down due to COVID and I have to say it was pretty terrifying idea to be an OKC in an OKC in Dublin um and I have no idea how that would have turned out and I'm I'm really sad I never got to do it um but yeah I think I, I, I would have felt some eyes on me you know you want to be good if you're gonna do it um I have slowly let the pressure go. I think when I first, because I trained in Dublin, I had this idea that, or you know, people would say like, ooh, eyes on you or everyone, you know, like, things like that. And, I, and I'd be, 
I'd be quite terrified. But I think, you know, as I've got older, I've just thought, I don't know, you know, as, as things happen, you just put less pressure on yourself and you think, okay, you know, you are who you are. And yeah, yeah, I think I could do an OKC now and not, and not absolutely freak out. <laughs> I think that's just down to maturity rather than anything else. But, you know. my, my sense is it would be probably sort of a mystical experience of channeling, you know, it's channeling the spirit of the ancestor. Would I, I feel that that would come across on the stage. I look forward to seeing it. I, I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> hope one day I will. Yeah. Like, but I think if I, if someone said you're going to die tomorrow, you have to do something. You know, one last chance to to act in something. I'd play Nora in Plough. I think. Mm. And like, if if I had to choose anything, you know, one part for the rest of my life, I'd, I'd do that. So hopefully, one day that will happen. And you're right. I mean, who knows what it'd be like? But I think yeah. it'd be amazing. I've seen so many Noras throughout my life, mm. and. Um, I always feel like it's just a crazy idea to like open that box and, and, and say the words yourself. It would be like, I, I've almost left it completely untouched because I'm like, yeah, it would be very surreal, but uh, yeah, it has to happen at some point. Talk to us a little bit about, um, we know that you started off doing the art history thing up in Edinburgh and then switched uh, across the RHC over to Trinity College to uh, enroll in the Lear Academy. So talk to us a little bit about that migration and uh, how that all played out. Well, that happened because I wasn't getting into drama school. And um, my parents were like, oh, why don't you just apply? Like, you may as well just apply to university. Um, and then I got in and they were like, oh, why don't you just go? You may as well just go. <laughs> you know, they were sort of like sneaking me in. And I loved art history. And I think for a long time I tried really hard to do something that wasn't acting um yeah I was like okay maybe I'll be a painter maybe I'll yeah it was never practical things <laughs> but I was trying not to be a, an actor and I did love art history I had a really great teacher when I was at school but I went to university I went to Edinburgh like kind of dragging my heels and all I did was just do plays with mm. like curricular stuff and I ended up actually failing my first year because I did <laughs> <laughs> Agnes, if I could jump in, I, I was an art art history major in, in college also. Mm -hmm. And I, I I gravitated towards it because it was practically the only thing I wasn't failing. <laughs> you know, and I really took an interest in it. And uh, perhaps if it, we're we were gonna we're gonna spend more time on the film in just in, in a few moments, but perhaps we'll have an art historical kind of question about the film. <laughs> yeah well god i'll try <laughs> um yeah i was but that was funny i did i i mean i i did i was also one of those things i had a great teacher at school and like first year of university it just didn't i actually didn't grab me in the same way i was sort of like sat at the back of lectures like oh so bored which is so s silly to say now like i wish i i'd love to go and do a degree now uh, yeah yeah same yeah time. Yeah, at the time I just wanted to, I remember calling my dad and being like, um, so I have failed everything. And he was like, I didn't say that, yeah. <laughs> I was getting that feeling. I was also, you know, I, at that time I was so stressed because I felt like time was like running by me and I felt like I had to be an incredibly successful actress before I turned 20. I remember turning 20 and being like, oh, it's all over for me, which is so funny to think of now. Um. And so, thank God, I got into the, the Lear and, yeah, it was just a huge relief. I couldn't believe I was finally getting in because it had been years of trying. And, um, yeah. Could we just, a lot of times on Irish Stew, we're, we're always, you know, we're, we're looking for kind of a, an Irish thread, a di all different kinds of versions of Irish, and there's different Irish stories. And what's, what's your Irish story living in the UK with Irish roots and then taking then what was your identity when you come over to Trinity and as w w what's your Irish identity about? So when I was young, I felt very connected to the idea that I was Irish and I 
thought because no one knew who Sean O'Casey was, but I was very connected to the players. I was like, God, I've just got this, this is this amazing secret about my life. Like I felt very connected to my family and like, cause it's an amazing experience being able to like read the words that your great granddad had written. And I had all these ideas and I'd been over to Dublin, but only to go and see his plays. And, and when I moved to Dublin, I was like, you suddenly are confronted by how embarrassing it was that you thought like you have this, like we are so many people have this who aren't Irish have this romantic idea of being Irish, I guess. And I completely did that. And then I was in my first class. I remember someone making a joke about nuns and everyone like bursting out laughing and getting a really like cathartic experience. Cause I wasn't raised Catholic either. And um, I remember being like, Oh no, there's like so many cultural things. <laughs> that I have not had a part of at all. Like there's like, I, I, um, yeah, I guess. And then I sort of had like a, a humble, it was quite humbling. I was like, Oh, okay. I've definitely been (laughs) almost fetishizing what it is to be Irish when actually not understanding it at all. And then, so living there was really great. And, you know, I learned so much and now like all my friends, you know, I go over there. I, like, I love it and I miss it loads. So, like, I, I could have ended up in Dublin, I think. But yeah, it was, it was funny. <laughs> well, there's still possibilities there, and uh, we're more than happy to claim you as Irish. You may be hyphenated Irish. I consider myself to be hyphenated Irish after living in America for 40 years. So, what do you got, a hyphen in it or not? You're part of the tribe, and we're delighted to have you on here. But I was going to... Um, Moving forward into your career, uh, obviously getting the job on the uh, TV series Ridley Road also pretty dips into another part of your identity, uh, but you also it also enabled you to cross paths with Lisa Mulcahy. So do you want to talk about uh, your dueling identities and, you know, your work on that TV series? Yeah, so I guess... Um I always feel bad because I give so much importance to my dad's part of the family because that's where I find our history is really interesting because that's the O'Casey side. His grandmother, his mum was Siobhan O'Casey and his dad, Larry Kennig, was um, American Jewish living in New York and had um, like um, his father had come over from Lithuania to Connecticut. Um, so I have like that element as well, all part of that family. Um, and yeah, so Ridley Road is a story about a Jewish woman who infiltrates a Nazi organization, um, led by Colin Jordan, which was re- really happened. Like uh, Colin Jordan's real and, um, his party was real, but I don't think my character was real. Although we do know that there was maybe a Jewish woman who infiltrated, but we, it's kind of, it's tricky to know because it's, mm-hmm. it's but it was an amazing first job to get um, because I found all of the, my dad found all these letters of that we had like write, uh, written down family history from that side. And um, it was also great to have a first job that really aligns with what you want to say politically. I feel like you mm-hmm. have so little um, agency as an actor whatsoever. You just want a job really badly. And then your mm-hmm. first job is like, a really cool anti-fascist mm. set in the 60s. I, was, I couldn't really believe it. And yeah, so that was a great job to get. And it was nice as well that my first job kind of connected me to my dad more, um, you know, given his um, <laughs> it, it was did, did, we, did I read your, your grandfather was living in New London, Connecticut? Yeah. Yeah, I know it well. I went to college in London, so I spent four four years there. So trotting some of the same sidewalks or streets as your grandfather. I really, I um, I've actually only been to America once. Yeah. Um, I really want to go and visit and walk around. And- oh, I'm, I'm sure we're going to get you over here very soon. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you could clear up just something for us. Uh, two films have come out and uh, the lies we tell is the one we, w- we want to move into right away. But there was also Miracle, Cl- the Miracle Club and, w- w- you know, kind of which came first because they seemed to come out at about the same, which. Lies we tell came first. Okay. I a bit of maths in my head, but yeah, Lies we tell came first and then the Miracle Club. And actually I think the Miracle Club filmed a whole year after. Okay. Well, let's just hear quickly about that, then dip back into the, the, the real reason we're here. The Miracle Club. On the movie poster, you're there with Maggie Smith, Stephen Ray, Laura Linney, and 
Kathy Bates. What what the heck was what did that all feel like? It felt incredibly surreal. <laughs> it, even, it still feels surreal. I remember when I was because I was cast really late in the process, so it was kind of like going. I had about four weeks to adjust, I think, to the idea that I was going to. But yeah, I remember walking into the hotel and someone being like, "Okay, time to meet Maggie." Being like, I can't believe this is happening and walking over. But it's funny how quickly you adjust to things like that because everyone was just very lovely and normal. You know, Maggie turned around and went, Oh, Maggie and Aggie. It's fun. <laughs> Would you like to take a seat? And then, and everyone's just doing the work. You know, it, yeah, it was fine. The idea of it was terrifying. But then as soon as we got into it, it was really fun. I like very surreal being able to like sit with them and hear their stories I was just sort of like stayed as quiet as possible just because you know did you were you absorbing things from the from the masters and the legends of of acting of course do you know one of the things that I loved so much was seeing Maggie on set because I was like wow okay so she's still working and she's over here in Dublin like away from her family I wonder why and then as soon as we sat down for our first scene I was like oh, it's because she loves it so much. Mm -hmm. She's just like completely emanating joy to like be acting. And I I don't know, I I found that really amazing. And also she was very helpful to me because the first scene we shot was my final scene where I'm like breaking down and revealing a huge secret, which was obviously horrifying. Sat there looking at Maggie, Kathy, Laura, and then... And she was like, and, and Maggie was like, okay, let's help you. Because the scene starts and I'm in hysterics already. So like, I feel like it was a great lesson in terms of like, I really want to be able to do that for younger actors starting if I'm ever in a situation where I can help them. Because yeah, it's, it's very scary. <laughs> of course, Maggie Smith, uh, probably, uh, I grew up watching Maggie Smith, uh, having growing up in Ireland, but she became, uh, with Downton Abbey, really a household name in America to a degree that, you know, despite her incredible career, she probably didn't have that kind of footprint or recognition. But um, I'm just thinking, you know, about Downton Abbey and period dramas, and that takes us into Lies We Tell, which is based on uh, a 19th century novel uh, called Uncle Silas. And I'm kind of wondering about your preparation, right, young woman? You know, grew up in the late 90s, early 2000s in London. Now, all of a sudden, you're going to be parachuted into Ireland in the mid-19th century. Do you read the original book? Do you rely on the script? How do you get started with this kind of stuff? Trying on the clothes? Like, I mean, man, you know, those freaking big hoop skirts, you know. <laughs> well, I don't have the legs for it, but, you know, you take my point. No, well, the legs are hidden, thank God, so you don't mm-hmm. well, yeah, There might be a serving grace then, maybe I will up for that the next time, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's great. And also because um, there's a bit in the script where it says, like, oh, I know her waist is very small and she's not very attractive. So in my course, it was, like, quite loose, which was amazing. I was like, <laughs> which yeah. was great because normally you're just sort of, like, absolutely dying. Where I, I had quite a good time there. The clothes definitely help. The first thing I did was read the book. and. Then the the great thing about it is, so you you would have heard from Elizabeth, she is a mastermind and she would just send me like um, etiquette books, all sorts of like things that Maud might do. I think something that I found really um, helpful was these sweet little horticultural books and little drawings of plants. Because I, I mean, it's funny as as an actor, my process is that you just sort of read as much as you can and you kind of never know what's going to inspire you. And for me, these funny horticultural books really help because I was like, okay, this is maybe what she's spending her time doing because thinking of Maud as a person who she just loves her own brain and spending time in her own mind and and she just sort of lives a quiet life of drawing and reading and playing piano in a very like simple way. She has simple pleasures and... and um. Yeah, so I found that very helpful. Also, uh, I, I the idea of thinking of her as someone who was given access to a library because at that time women weren't even allowed to read in their head because, you know, you might have a private thought and that could be kind of dangerous. It's easier to sort of know what they might be taking in if they're reading out loud. But Maud 
is allowed to read by herself and has a lot of time alone. So I think that was my favourite in about her. That's what started it off because she's met with her cousins who are very socialised and have been part of society and maybe know a little bit more about how things should be. But she doesn't have that um, hard wiring. She's kind of very much her own person because she's just grown up with her dad. So I think, yeah. Yeah, I guess you just read and read and read and hope that (laughs) that something, it starts to sort of emanate from you. I think sometimes, you know, I don't really have much control over my process. I'm not very Mm. like mathematical. I do this, I do that. Mm -hmm. I just sort of like take in as much as possible and then try and forget about it when you're on set because yeah, that that wraps up my And and you were certainly on set a lot, (laughs) you know, outside of some scenics, uh, a couple of views into the, uh, into the, lawns and the parklands around the mansion the the dark downton abbey that that this was uh this film revolved around uh you're you're there all the time all the time and uh how how long was the uh how long was the filming 21 days 21 days very intense very intense there were times where i would be walking to set and they'd be sewing my costume on me like finishing something and, and they'd be like walk slightly slower <laughs> and then the first ad would be like aggie hurry up and they'd be like no no slow <laughs> and, you're, and you're like uh, one second <laughs> <laughs> so there was a lot going on it was so fun though because like everyone was doing it because they really loved the script and i remember like my first day i remember the boom operator coming up to me and saying oh hello i'm the boom operator like i love this script i think it's going to be amazing and i was like uh. Like everyone is so invested in what it is. And it's, it was so fun because it it was intense, especially because like for those people who have seen the film, like I had to be in a pretty heightened state the whole time, which maybe was good. It was only 21 days actually. I'm so amazed to hear you talk about this as being fun, you know, like rewarding and you know, those, those kinds of terms. So it's interesting to hear how the experience of something that's very serious and focused could be fun. And I just want to mention like a couple of comments I saw in some reviews, your performance gives the film a serrated edge. Your delivery is as sharp as a steak knife. And the film in the garden was disca- described as an elegantly cut Gothic period drama. There's some pretty pointed imagery there. Uh, how, how do you, I mean, and, and I think it's perfectly appropriate. How do you react to that? Do you know what? I tend to be pretty, um, I, I find it quite horrifying hearing about myself. I, I normally am like very sort of like, oh, I'm really proud of this film. And I think that's actually very, um, it's a new feeling for me. I think it's because I love the script so much and everyone works so hard. When I hear stuff like that, I'm just filled with, I, I just can't believe that. I'm so proud and I'm so grateful and happy that we pulled it off and we did it. And whereas before, sometimes I read other reviews and I'm like, oh God, they're just, oh, they're saying that to be nice or whatever. <laughs> um, they don't really mean it or, you know, people don't really know what they're talking about. You know, I'd say something like that, but this getting the recognition is fantastic also when we premiered in Galway um that uh Screen Daily review came out just as we walked out of the cinema so I was like that was like pretty I was a pretty incredible five minutes actually the film had finished I'd been horrified because also as you say I'm never off the screen so as the actor watching it, it's pretty horrifying you like never have a relief you're never not in the scene you're like oh god this is relentless and then I came out, that review came out and then I turned around and saw, um, actually this actress, Kathy Belton, who was the first woman I saw play Nora. I'd never met her before. And she said, congratulations, you were amazing in the film. I just burst into tears and I was like, you made me want to be an actor. It was very, it was a big, it was a big five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I love, I'm really glad and it was really great that Guardian review came out. That was that was really thrilling, especially because it was such a small set, so few of us. The idea that 
it's been seen and loved by loads of people is amazing because like it was just like I don't know how many were in the crew but it felt like 50 you know or maybe less of us running around this big old house for like 20 days so it feels like a very intimate experience you know I was just thinking you know there, there was such incredible intensity in in these performances and you played particularly well uh, in your work with David Wilmot, who is presented in like a really interesting way. He's not just an obvious bad guy. There is kind of, he has a performance that's nuanced, I think, which kind of speaks to his own troubles and difficulties and sorrows, etc. And I think your performance kind of, you know, you're obviously acknowledging that in the course of your performance. But talk about working with David. Well, I think there's something about David's performance that it's like you can really see the charming, like, lovable, interesting man underneath, you know? And, I mean, in terms of actually acting with him in the process, it was pretty amazing because he, like, always wanted to run scenes. So we'd, like, meet in the hotel and we'd run and we'd run. And and he was very kind in the amount of, like, respect he gave my opinions in the sense of, you know, like, He's a very accomplished, amazing actor. And I am like just at the beginning of my career. And I felt it was really fun. I think that's that's probably what I felt very encouraged by him. You know, we'd we'd run scenes, I'd say, oh, maybe this, maybe that. And he'd be like, yes, you know, he'd he was very generous. And I think that's maybe what it's down to him in terms of like our repartee. Because I felt very comfortable with him. And um yeah, and his performance is so good because he is menacing but he's also you know you do feel for him so much and also I think that Maud really wants family so she looks past a lot of red flags because she's so determined to be part of this like image that she's had in her head being surrounded by a loving family and then slowly it's like you watch her kind of heartbreak where she's like okay that is just not going to be the case this is not it's not going to happen. And at the end of the film, when she says, like, I would have loved you, I think she really means it. Like, I really, really would have loved you if you'd let me. Yeah. Mm. Well, I guess uh, w- one more film related question before the curtain comes down here. Um, and I'm thinking back to the art history part of it. And I did mention it with uh, with Lisa, the um the sort of Renaissance painting quality to to the look and the the lighting, the candlelights of uh, Georges de la Tour and some of the Vermeer like aspects. Uh, what did you think of the aesthetics when you finally saw the film? How, how did did it surprise you really the way it looked, or, did, or could you envision it just from the sets? I mean, we were only using candlelight on set, so it was pretty beautiful, even when we were there. But I just think that like, yeah, the set design and the way it's been lit is incredible. I love, like, I did find that thrilling to see the final image of it and how, but it was very atmospheric when we were on set as well. Like it is so wonderful, all the candlelight. I've never done something where it's just candles. And like, it it did add a kind of comic element because, you know, we'd... (laughs) You'd have to keep the candles the same level, you know, all of that sort of stuff. Oh, like it, it created some oh, real the, the continuity. Yeah. Yeah. See, the candle yeah. growing and shrinking wouldn't be a good idea, you know. Exactly, yeah. And Lisa's like very, you know, like nothing would get by Lisa. She wouldn't let a candle be doing that in the scene. So you'd be in it, really in it, and they'd be like, blow out your candle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Because um, someone on IMDB would be critiquing the continuity mistakes of the the candles being exactly jumping around in the background. It do, yeah, right, right. Oh, God. The, right. Um, <laughs> so, so not a, not an extremely high budget film, but the candle budget was completely off the hook. The, I think so. I think it was, <laughs> yeah. Cause they were saying, Oh, you know, it saved a lot of money using candles, but then our uh, producer Ruth was like, no, it didn't. They were double wick. They were fancy candles. <laughs> <laughs> they, were, they were good candles. The, the quality of light in those candles was, was very, very high. Yes. Well, one final question from us. Uh, what are you doing now and what's coming up next? So now um, I'm working on another period drama. I did 
you know, if you've read or heard of, you know, Wolf Hall, the of books course. by Hilary Mantel. <laughs> so they're making the final series of that, uh, Mirror in the Light. And I'm playing Lady Margaret Douglas, who's um, Henry VIII's niece, who causes a bit of trouble, which is really fun. I love period dramas. It's great. It's also like, it's just so great as well with Lies We Tell when there's a lot of source material stuff to read. Like it's just, it's a good nerdy job. And then um, Small Things Like These is coming out next summer, I think. The Killian Murphy's oh. um, film adaption of a Claire Keegan novel. I don't know if you saw A Quiet Girl or A Colleen Kewen. Um It's written by the same woman. Really looking forward to that. I haven't got to see it yet, but it's started to, people have started seeing it. So. We had them on as guests as well, the uh, the Quiet Girl folks. Did you? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That film so much. Yeah, I've had the pleasure of uh, reading small things like these, and I think it's every bit of a masterpiece as the Quiet Girl book, which, uh, of course, in its original was called uh, Foster, I believe. So I'm just thinking you're you're continuing to move, or, or uh, you know, I'm not sure if you're playing against Mark Rylance in uh, Wolf Hall. Or Killian Murphy, you know, where there's an opportunity to have a scene with him. But uh, they're two obviously incredible guys uh, uh, to at least observe their work, and hopefully, you know, you, you get to have a couple of scenes as well. You know, yeah. Well, that's one of the things I kind of can't believe the people I've got to act against. If Killian doesn't win the Academy Award, there's something wrong. I would be very shocked. It'd yeah. be. Yeah, I would be shocked. I love, and so unfortunately, I don't get to be in any scenes with Killian because I'm playing his mum in the flashbacks. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I just got to sort of like chat to him, or like, you know, at the coffee stand. But so I can't wait. I haven't seen any of his bits. So I'm, oh, yeah, I, I think it's going to be pretty amazing. So with that, both John and I and our listeners, thank you for taking the time to sit with us. Uh, we think Lies We Tell is an extraordinary period drama. As a matter of fact, you can drop the period piece out of there and just say it's an extraordinary drama and your work on that, as our other two guests, was totally compelling. This is a film. It's a must-see film. We're delighted that it's being featured in the uh, Washington Irish Film Festival, uh, the Capital Irish Film Festival, I should say. And uh, we look forward uh, to tracking your career and hopefully have another opportunity to talk again as your career goes on. And we're delighted to see all of your success. So thank you. Thanks so much, Agus. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, John, although we didn't ask our guests for their shameless plug, I think it's pretty safe to assume what they might have said. I agree, Martin. Their shameless plug had to be something along the lines of please support Solus Nua Capital Film Festival, showcasing the best in Irish film, especially the four-day festival opening night, marquee attraction on February 29th, Lies We Tell. Irish Stew is produced by John Lee, Martin Nutty, and Bill Schultz. Editing, mixing, and mastering by Bill Schultz. Music on Irish Stew was composed and performed by Rosa Nutty, with Donald Bowens on drums, Cahalo Reardon on bass and synthesizer. For more on Rosa Nutty's music, please visit rosanutty.com. <laughs>